I'm actually going to be back in this room this afternoon at 4 o'clock with 50 Ingram scholars. We're having their sessions in here this afternoon. Uh, I'm a historian of Latin America. And a few years ago, this, these guys from the teaching company showed up in my classroom and they were interested in doing a course, but they told me, this is probably still true, Latin America won't sell. <laughs> well, we'd like you to do a course. So we talked a while and they said, okay, why don't we do something on the history of the Americas? So we put together courses on the conquest of the Americas and it was easy for me because French and the English don't show up until the end of the course. <laughs> so, all right, that's fine. Um, and after a while, they came back and said, well, okay, what if you did a second one? I said, well, the log I'd finished about the 17th century. And so I said, okay, well, logically, you do the age of revolution. And you can do all the Americas. I sort of blithely said this, right? And I said, okay, let's try that. So then I suddenly realized, oh, you got to do the American Revolution. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> and actually, you have to start with that. <laughs> Um, so I put together courses on the Americas and the Age of Revolution, and um, it's also mainly Latin America, right, because there's most of the countries in the hemisphere. But I also, you know, had to learn about the British West Indies and, of all things, Canada. <laughs> the Canadian case. We'll actually get the Canadians in here a little bit. Um, so I put together this class, and at the same time I was writing a history of Latin America, and so it actually means that my history of Latin America is much more informed by history of the Americas. Um, it's much more comparative in that sense. Uh, I think it actually makes things more interesting to see this in hemispheric perspective. So part, part of what I want to do over the next six weeks is talk about, it really as a history of the Americas in this particular time period. And so I, I'm going to give you the big picture today. Right. Talk about all the really interesting stuff. Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, industrialism, all that sort of stuff. And then we'll go through cases. Well, it, in that course, I went through literally every country in the Americas, uh, including the unsuccessful ones, which is pretty instructive, what we'll see here, because there are wars for independence that failed, including in this country right, in the mid-19th century. Um, so we'll look at both sort of what succeeds, but also it's often tend to be overlooked that there are cases where it doesn't work. And those are actually pretty instructive. There are places where there is no war for independence, right? Which is instructive too. Why is it the Canadians don't have this kind of upheaval? We do. Um, word about revolutions. I actually teach a course on reform and revolution in 20th century Latin America, and it's a big deal in this class. The sort of driving theme through is that I use revolution in a much more precise sense. We, you've heard this word thousands of times in the last few weeks in dealing with Middle East and North Africa. I doubt, I may be wrong on this, that any of those movements we've seen in the last two months will be revolutions in the true sense of the word. Uh, so I'm going to use revolution here in sort of two senses. One in the looser sense of it's these wars and upheaval. But as we'll see as we move through this, there are very few of these cases that would fit the sort of political science definition of revolution, which means a fun truly fundamental transformation of a society a political system of an economy. There are long arguments of where the American Revolution is really fitting this definition. And the classic examples of this in the Western world, or in the world in the last two centuries, tend to be the French Revolution, Russia in 1917, China in 1949. Those are sort of the classic cases. In Latin America, Mexico in the 1910s, Cuba after 1959, where you see a complete, fundamental, total transformation of the economic systems, the political processes, social organization. Most of the cases we're going to see in here in Latin America are not revolutions in this classic traditional sense. Right? There is a big change, but the sort of cynical thing, I'll say this again <laughs> over the next year, the cynical interpretation of the wars for independence in most of the Americas is it's old horse, new rider. Right? <laughs> so this is why if you're watching Egypt, Right? The real question is, do you get somebody else in place of Mubarak? Or do you really have a more democratic Egypt, a more open Egypt, right? a more participatory, or is it simply we just get somebody else who's in control of the system? All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the big picture today. And the next time, I'll get Sam to help me on this one. When I did, this, when I did these lectures, I wrote them all up. And, 
got ready to go tape them, and I went to Dan Usner in our department and said, Dan, could you please read these so I'm not doing something really stupid? <laughs> but as you'll see, when I get to the American Revolution next week, it actually, my take on the American Revolution is probably very different from somebody that does US history because I'm looking from the south upwards at it as opposed to looking at it from internally. So we'll look at the American Revolution next time, then we'll look at Haiti. Haiti is often completely overlooked in this. And it is truly a radical transformation. The largest slave rebellion in the history of the Americas and the most successful. And then we'll spend a few weeks on Spanish America. For those of you who know me, this is important in my life, but in the end, the most important country in, in the Americas is Brazil. <laughs> right, Obama recognized this and finally went there. Um, so we'll talk about different, and I'm not going to cover all of Latin America. I'm going to pick out particular cases which I think are the most interesting. And as we'll see here in a second, we'll actually end with my two favorite countries. <laughs> Texas, it's a whole nother country, right? We'll end with Brazil and Texas. All right, so that's the sort of the logic of what we're going to go through. All right, so in this period of the age of revolution, so I, it has some nice dates to it, especially if you pick Texas at the end, right? 1776 to 1836, a nice cycle. When people teach about the age of revolutions, they actually believe there is such a thing. They tend to sort of pick different dates and beginning and end points. Uh, I have these nice little brackets, right? It's beginning with the American Revolution, ending with the last successful rebellion, right? emphasize successful, in the cycle, which is Texas in 1836. When I was putting this course together, I'm sort of grappling, okay, now what do I, how do I end this? And suddenly, it's my own state. <laughs> it's Texas. And, it, and after a while, when we said, this is not just Texas show, this actually makes a lot of sense, right? As we'll see when we get to the end. But this is the close of the cycle. There will be other rebellions, right? Other phases. The most spectacular is the U.S. The war for Southern independence, right? It fails. So Texas is really the end of this cycle. But what it creates over a period of about five to six decades is about 18 new independent nations. Right? So for those who tend to focus on the American Revolution, well, that's just the beginning. Right? What it is is this wave of re revolts, and in some cases, truly revolutionary revolts, that will, by the 1830s, have created about 18 new countries. This is the first in the great waves of cycles of independence in the last 200 years. The next great wave comes after the first, about the time of the First World War and its aftermath, which sees the emergence of a whole wave of new independent nations. The next wave comes at the end of the Second World War, what we tend to call decolonization. And the last wave just happened, right? It's the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of a whole new set of independent nations. Right? So there's sort of these four waves. So what we're really looking at is the first of these great waves. What it brings into existence are more than a dozen Latin American countries, the United States, and for a brief moment, Texas, right? Which is, uh, this is why the Texans still tend to think of themselves as an independent country, right? They were for 10 years, it's an odd situation. But so this is, what we're gonna see is the creation of, and again, this map, these really are dotted lines, right? Those lines are complete fiction, nobody's guarding them, <laughs> nobody's marked them out. So as you move away from the ma major cities and the coast, it's anybody's guess of who actually controls this. This is why when we get to Texas, what we'll see, part of the discussion is where exactly does Mexico end and the United States begin? All right, so here we go, big picture. Um, what we're really looking at here is the birth of the modern world, the world we were born into, right? I say born into because it's possible that another 50, 60 years, we're gonna look back and say another age has just begun. It is conceivable to me as a historian, we have entered into the next phase, right? It probably began in the 1980s and 1990s. The Great Recession of the moment is just one more piece of this. What we're seeing is a fundamental transformation into the next wave of world history that we don't really recognize yet. We see it might be coming, but it'll take some distance to see this. But the creation of the modern world, get, to get really basic here, everything in Western civilization is in a trinity, right? <laughs> So when you, the classical way of dividing up world history says the ancient world, right? And then there's the middle, right? The Middle Ages, fall of Rome in the fifth century, all these sort of arguments, where does the Middle Ages end? But about the 14th century or so, the Middle Ages end, and then you get the modern world. 
And for those who study the modern world, they'll sort of argue those first couple of centuries or so are really the early modern period. So they'll sort of say, okay, this period that begins in the 15th and 16th centuries is really the creation, the origins of this modern world. And in a lot of textbooks, they'll say, you want a particular date when the modern world begins? 1789. They'll date it to the French Revolution. So what we're really seeing created here in the late 18th century is the world which we are born into, the political ideologies, the economic systems, the worldview. I always joke that I am clearly a child of the Enlightenment. <laughs> Truly a child of the Enlightenment, right? And most of us in here probably are, probably almost everyone. What takes place here in simple terms is there's a cultural transformation, to use that term broadly, that we sort of lump into this thing called the Enlightenment. The way in which people see the world, the kind of cultural references shift in the 18th century. The economic system of the globe begins to shift dramatically in the 18th century, what we sort of label the Industrial Revolution. Right? The Industrial Revolution beginning sometime in the mid to late 18th century fundamentally alters the nature of the world economically. Right? And these revolutions are part of the political transformation that begins in the late 18th century. So the economic system we live under, capitalism, the political systems that battle for supremacy in the 20th century, liberalism, classical political liberalism, and socialism emerge in the late 18th century. So what we're really looking at here at the age of revolution is the birth of the modern world as we know it. So what I'm going to do is talk about these transformations, sort of sense why is it in the late 18th century suddenly you see these guys rising up all over the Americas and revolting? What's the, why do they all sort of simultaneously start trying to do this? And then I'm going to give you a brief, very brief overview of the colonial empires in the Americas, so you'll sort of see here's the big picture of who controls what, before we then go in and say, okay, now why do these British citizens in this little coastal area in the mainland of North America decide they're going to revolt, all right? But Spain and Portugal are more important. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll let the French in. All right, so here we go. So these are nice brackets, 1776, beginning of the American Revolution, 1836. It really is from the American Revolution to the Texas Revolution, although if you want to use revolution in a traditional sense, Texas is not a revolution. <laughs> it's simply a war for independence. Uh, and again, this is the first age of these wars for independence, the cycles, late 18th, early 19th century, early 20th, mid 20th, and then now the late 20th century. Depending on how you count them, there are 18 or 19 new nations by 1836. I got 19 in there because I'm counting Texas at that point. <laughs> it is an independent country for 10 years. And again, I want to emphasize, they're successful and unsuccessful examples. So we tend to look at this and say, oh, how does Bolivia become independent? How do the Brazilians? But there are a lot of places where there is no revolt or they fail. Canada is a pretty interesting juxtaposition when you look at the United States. So well, why is it these British citizens in these 13 colonies are willing to fight this bloody war? And 80 to 100,000 of them leave and go up to Canada and go, nope, <laughs> not interested. Right? Um, and Canada never really has this kind of conflict other British colonies, right? Cuba, right, does not have a war for independence in this age. Cuba becomes the last major military bastion of the Spanish Empire. It is the stable for the troops in the wars for independence. It also is a large slave society and they have just watched what happened in, in Haiti. So Cuba has no war for independence in this phase, but then it'll have a bloody war in the middle of the century that fails, and then after 1898, with US intervention, it becomes independent. So Cuba is an odd case. Puerto Rico is along the same lines. Puerto Rico is even stranger because Puerto Rico does not become independent. Right? Both Cuba and Puerto Rico are occupied by the US Army. One becomes independent, the other eventually evolves into a free associated state, the only one. Dominican Republic is the most problematic. I have no explanation here. <laughs> Dominican Republic, which is the eastern two thirds of the island of Hispaniola that borders on Haiti, it will be invaded by, well, it depends on your perspective, I guess. It is annexed by Haiti, <laughs> right? For about 20 years, from the 1820s to the 1840s, it becomes independence, and then it tries to annex itself to everybody in sight, including the United States. By one vote, right, in the 1860s, the bill to the treaty to annex the Dominican Republic at their request into the United States fails in the Senate. One vote. Imagine this, the vote had shifted, the Dominican Republic today would be part of the United States. 
So there are good examples here of places that don't succeed. All right, so here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> uh, the favorite thing I've ever taught, I, the first year I was out of graduate school, I taught Loyola, Loyola Marymount, and I taught Western Civ at 10 o'clock in the morning, at 12 o'clock, and at 2 o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But it's really big picture stuff. Okay, now part of the reason these revolts are taking place in this period is because the larger cultural and intellectual transformation is taking place. This begins way before the 18th century. Somebody who used to be in the history of science, it really begins with the scientific revolution in the 16th and 17th century, right? Copernicus in the 1540s says, oh wait, the sun's the center of the universe. How do we figure this out? Galileo comes along, the telescope. The culmination of the scientific revolution is usually Newton in the 1660s, right? He writes this book in Latin, mathematical principles, and says, let me explain to you how the universe operates, mathematically. So this new kind of math that we now call calculus. So in this period from about the 1540s to the 1660s, the emergence of what we today take for granted, the modern scientific worldview, right? That you analyze something, you test it, you experiment, you try it out, you try and explain how it works, you use the language of mathematics to try and describe it. This emerges in the 16th and 17th centuries. What this does also, it begins to say what matters is not only reason, but evidence, empiricism. It's what I call, eventually becomes what, in the 20th century, what I call the imperialism of the scientific worldview. Unless you can taste it, touch it, feel it, measure it, it's not worth studying, all right? Ultimately, this becomes what people, <coughs> the extremists will say, so all these other <coughs> questions, that you can't empirically verify, they're not worth asking. You know, things like, is there a God? <laughs> that kind of stuff, unimportant, right? You can't test it. So this emerges, this thing we take for granted today, right? That you want to see proof, that that proof is founded in evidence and repeated and tested. This emerges in the 16th and 17th century. So by the 18th century, this increasingly leads to skepticism of authority, right? Why should I believe this simply because you tell me, right? This is kind of a problem for the Catholic Church <laughs> and for monarchy. Divine right, of course. So that skepticism in the age of reason, right, is more and more the use this logic of reason, examining evidence which is empirical and can be tested and verified. So increasing this sort of skeptical worldview leads to question of fundamental institutions. It's like the bumper sticker you see on cars occasionally here, question authority, right? And so by the mid 18th century, you have all these great intellectuals and philosophers, especially focused around France, right? Voltaire and Diderot and all these guys are saying, reason, logic, questioning, that's what you need to do. So here we got Rousseau up on the top, Voltaire and Diderot, who I always love this quote. It sort of epitomizes the, the ultimate question of traditional authority. Diderot supposedly says, the world will not be a safe place until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> when I would tell that quote at Loyola Marymount, I was like, OK, OK, but this is not me. It's Diderot. <laughs> Uh, so the Enlightenment is a fundamental transfer. The worldview we have today, our faith in reason, right, emerges out of the 18th century. Um, and so this kind of context is the, op is the operating world of what's going on on both sides of the Atlantic, right? Because in effect, what you have is you see with these colonial, these colonial empires are global. But there is an enormous <coughs> system all over the Atlantic world of slaves and colonists and goods moving back and forth across the Atlantic. So somebody discussing this in France, they're reading it in the heartland of Brazil. They're reading it in the mountains of Central America. They're reading it in Boston, in the Alleghenies, right? So this is a, not just Europe, it's all over the Atlantic world. Now my favorite here is the Industrial Revolution. I remember sitting through a lecture at one point in the, our department of by a prominent speaker and one of the faculty members of the economics department at the time said, well, the Industrial Revolution is a myth. It doesn't exist. We can't show it. <laughs> well, okay, well, maybe, maybe statistically in your world, no, but something happened here, right? 
and from my point of view as a former historian of technology, the transformation of the Industrial Revolution is hard as technological. Right? You move from human and animal power to fossil fuel, in this case, primarily coal. And the way in which you transform and translate that power is through machinery. The steam engine being the classic example of the 18th century. There's a second industrial revolution the last, at the end of the 19th century. It's new types of fuels, primarily petroleum, right? And new ways of translating that into use by machinery, primarily through electricity and through turbines. So you have these kinds of technological transformations, but it's more than a technological transformation because when you can provide that power, build those machines, you can then have factories, consolidate people, you start to have urbanization, and all major industrial revolutions across the world are always accompanied by an agricultural revolution. Right? It's the agricultural revolution of the 17th century in England that forces all these people off the land but makes the land productive enough to pay all these people to feed these people when they're all in the cities, right? As someone who used to live in Kansas, the bumper stickers would say, feeding you is what farming is. <laughs> right? So you gotta have, you know, greater and greater agricultural productivity, which then allows you to move people into cities and have factories and concentrate people who don't grow their own food. So from about the 1760s to about the 1830s, same as the age of, Re age of revolution, with England as the leading, most dynamic force, is what you create is a new form of economic organization in the world. On this tiny little island of a few million people, what you create is the economic model that will dominate the world for the next 200 years. So the Industrial Revolution, with its dark satanic mills, right, creates this new kind of technological power, but it brings with it a new form of social organization of people in cities, and it creates the economic growth is going to drive the world, right? Because in order for the industrialization to keep moving forward, you have to create, constantly innovate and create new machinery to be better than the other guy, and you constantly need to seek resources. The English don't have enough coal. They don't have enough iron ore. They don't have enough cotton and wool. They have to get it from somewhere else. So it's a dynamic thing that pushes global trade to an entirely new level. The first wave of, we all talk about globalization, first wave of globalization is in the 15th and 16th centuries. As the Europeans expand out across the entire globe, Columbus is the front wave of this. It creates colonial empires. The second great wave is in the late 18th and early 19th century as you intensify the exploitation of these places on the planet. So now you need even more productive colonies that provide you with both the resources to fuel your industry and people who will consume these. So England's at the forefront of this, but then it spreads across the channel to the Northwest, into France, and eventually across the Atlantic to New England. But I want to emphasize, this is a transformation not only of cities and industry, but it has to be accompanied by a transformation in labor and agriculture. This is why I put so much pressure on the slave system. As you become more and more productive and move towards wage labor and factories, people start to ask themselves, does slave labor make sense? Should we keep this? So the English in the 19th century who were leading the fight to end slavery, right, there's actually good arguments that slavery was still incredibly profitable and productive, but the English believe <laughs> that it's not, so that's what matters, right? It doesn't matter whether it's productive or they believe it's not. And so England, which really is pioneering slavery in the eighth, or multiplying slavery dramatically in the 18th century, right, in the 19th century turns the full force of its power against the slave trade and slavery. So the, Enlightenment, this cultural and intellectual transformation, and then this economic revolution takes place is driving things. So you have this upheaval, right? The world is being reorganized economically. The way in which you look at the world is shifting. And part of this shift is going to lead to political revolutions. And the American Revolution is the opening salvo. When I started doing this course, I wasn't really convinced the American Revolution was a revolution. <laughs> As a Latin American, I went, oh, God, you're just a bunch of planters who took over, yeah. These guys were all slave owners, and so they, all it is now they're in control. It looks just like Latin America. But Gordon Wood and a few other people convinced me, no, this actually is a radical revolution. Um, so the American Revolution is really the opening salvo in this. It becomes the great model, especially for the Latin American elites, that it is possible for colonies to revolt against a powerful empire 
and succeed. It is pretty extraordinary when we look back and this this little bitty chunk of land on the coast of North America. And these guys revolt against this powerful global empire and they actually win. It's pretty amazing. Uh, the French Revolution though, for if you ask most people outside the United States, especially if you ask the Latin American, that's what they're going to point at. They're going to say, this is what mattered. Because right? the French Revolution is clearly deeply radical. Right? You kill the king, <laughs> lots of other people. You go from monarchy, feudalism, to this completely different system. And in fact, much of, this is why I said the birth, much of our political terminology today literally comes out of the French Revolution. The whole thing we do with right wing, left wing, it's where people sat in the assembly. Those who were more radical sat on the left and those who were more conservative sat on the right. So if they sat the other way, today we'd be calling Glenn Beck a left winger. <laughs> you know, Fidel Castro is this right winger, right? So even the, kind of the creation of the modern political spectrum, the entire political spectrum, what we think is extreme right, extreme left, comes out of the French Revolution. And the French then create an army and Napoleon eventually takes control of it and they go all over Europe knocking over monarchies and creating enormous upheaval over the next 15 years. So the ideas that emerge out of the American and French revolutions, especially classical political liberalism, in the sense everybody in the American political system is a liberal, right? It's classical political liberalism, the belief in individual rights, equality before the law at its most basic. John Stuart Mill, my favorite, right? on liberty. You should be free to do anything you want with only two exceptions. If you're infringing on someone else's rights or you're harming someone. Otherwise, it should be up to you. Right? And so this notion of liberalism, this is incredibly crazy, radical, <laughs> you know, beyond the pale when it emerges. And then in fact that you're a citizen who is part of a social contract, right? We, the undersigned, right, agree to this, and this is our social compact, right? <clears throat> that you're not the subject, and that ultimately the best form of government is this thing called a republic. It's not monarchies, right? It's to have a republic with citizens. Okay, I don't want to overdo this, right? Because let's face it, when they all sat down to sign the Declaration of Independence and formulate the Constitution, they meant all people like us, <laughs> right? <laughs> which meant none of those slaves, no women, no people who are poor, <laughs> right? So at that moment, they meant everybody gets into the club who's like us, right? And the radicalism of the American Revolution in the long run is over a 200 year period, gradually that becomes to mean everyone, right? Regardless of your skin color, your gender, as long as you reach a certain age, you're in the club, right? But this notion of liberalism is gonna be incredibly powerful as we're going to see in Latin America, it has a different twist to it, which is why Latin America looks so different today than the United States or Canada. But the emergence of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, pushed forward this. And much of the early 19th century is a, is a really ferocious response of the conservative reaction to stop this, <laughs> right? The, the Congress of Vienna at the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1814, 1815, the whole notion is, okay, we're going to go back to monarchy, <laughs> a conservative political order where the elites run things, right? Let's hold the, hold the fort here. So part of the struggle in the early 19th century is how do you not only promote liberalism and come to power, but how do you stay in power and promote what you're trying to do, right? Which is why if you liberate Colombia, you also want to liberate Ecuador and Peru, and you need allies, right? You need more country, people like us. But Thomas Paine is a sort of great figure in mobilizing the rhetoric of this, as we'll see. All right, so that's the big picture on the moment. All right, here's a quick lesson in colonialism in the Americas. <laughs> Boy, there's a lot abbreviated here. So the first great world power, global power, is Spain and Portugal. You could actually make an argument the Portuguese are really ahead of everybody else. Right? No one remembers the Portuguese for this, right? But basically in the late 15th century, the Europeans, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the poor folks, especially the Portuguese, begin to go out across the entire globe, everywhere, quite literally, where there's water. Right? The Spanish become the most successful, 
And it's by sheer accident, as we'll see here in a second. Um, but the Portuguese are really out there. The Portuguese are more technologically advanced. They have better notions of astronomy. They really know what they're doing. They're going in the right direction to get to Asia. <laughs> Columbus is going the wrong direction. That's why the Portuguese don't back it. All right? So what you see is it's the Spanish and the Portuguese at the forefront of this process. And there are lots of other people trying to do this. Here is my quick four reasons why Spain and Portugal are at the forefront. Why the Europeans? First of all, technologically, they have adapted everything this is useful, almost all of which came out of the Indian Ocean and the Eastern Mediterranean. Deep hull sailing craft, triangular sails, Latin sails to give maneuverability, compass, astrolabes, all the, all the sky charts, all the stuff comes out of the Arab world and further east, right? The Portuguese and the Spanish adopt this, and this is what allows them to navigate on the high seas and move anywhere. They're at the forefront of this. They're the first to consolidate politically so they can focus on moving outwards, right? The first nation state to emerge in Europe is actually Portugal. By the mid 13th century, in the mid 13th century, the boundaries of what today's modern Portugal are in place. There's a monarchy, and they're not going to take over Spain <laughs> and the rest of its water, right? So the Portuguese, they're on the ocean, right? It's no surprise that you can internally consolidate and you move outwards. Spain is next, 1492. The last Muslim stronghold is defeated in southern Spain and Granada. And what we think of today as Spain is more or less consolidated in a group of kingdoms under Fernando and Isabel, the joint monarchy. So it's not a surprise that just as they finish this reconquest of the peninsula, uh, let's, take a, let's take a gamble on this Columbus guy. <laughs> maybe it'll work, maybe not. Right? Let's face it here, I'll beat up on those. The Germans and the Italians can't get this together until the 19th century. <laughs> right? English are still killing each other in the War of Roses and stuff. It's really not until the 16th and 17th century. So it's because they get their act together so quick that they're able to move outwards. So they consolidate politically. They have the technological ability. And like the rest of the Europeans, are pushed outward across the globe by this incredible, <coughs> dynamic, progressive worldview that goes back to the Bible, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Go out and understand the world and dominate it. Control it, right? And so what you will see is that the Spanish and the Portuguese are the first of these wave of Europeans who really see the world as their oyster. They want to go out. They just don't want to know what's there. They want to know it and use it. Um, the last thing that's pushing all these guys out is capitalism. The emergence of what we think of today as capitalism is built upon constant seeking new profits, new goods, new markets. So part of what's pushing them out is economic, right? They need access to all these things. So the Europeans start to move out in the 15th and 16th century. The Portuguese are actually glo truly global, as you'll see here in a second. They have an empire that stretches from Nagasaki right, to Brazil. They have a truly global commercial empire. Brazil, as we're going to see, which is, after all, the most important country, is the great exception in the Portuguese empire. Portuguese don't want to colonize and settle. They want to set up a trading post and trade with you. Right? So they will have trading posts all over the world. And Brazil, again, is the great exception. They actually colonize Brazil. The Spanish, Columbus goes off in 1492. Because he's going to go about 2,500 miles, he's going to end up in the East Indies. He goes about 2,500 miles, he hits islands, he goes, ah, I'm in India. These people are Indians. <laughs> He can't figure out why it is none of them speak the right languages. Uh, he stumbles around. He goes back, and they keep sending more expeditions across. In 1519, 1520, one of these expeditions lands on the coast of what today is Mexico. And Cortez and his men move into the central part of Mexico, stumble onto what is one of the two largest empires in the Americas, the Aztecs, engages in a civil war. And the Spanish take control of the Aztec Empire by the 1520s. An empire of millions of people, enormous resources, and as it turns out, in the deserts to the no north of the empire, the world's largest silver deposits. Mexico today is still the world's largest producer of silver. Another one of these expeditions crosses Panama. They work their way down along the coast of Western South America. They stumble on this enormous empire. The Incas and Pizarro and his men engage in a civil war. Capture the Incan Empire, maybe 10 million people. And as it turns out, in the mountains up in what today is Bolivia, some of the world's largest silver reserves. 
So the Spanish Empire is conquering internal territories, taking control of those empires, exploiting the resources, and in particular, the silver. So Spain will be the richest country in the world in the 16th century, built on American silver. So the Spanish Empire, you see on a map here in a second, is largely built on colonial settlement, exploitation of indigenous peoples, and eventually of African slaves. The center points of the, Portuguese, of the Spanish Empire are going to be what today is central Mexico, <coughs> Peru, which actually includes Bolivia at that point. These are the two cores of the Spanish Empire in the Americas. They're under Spanish control by the 1540s. 200 years before things really get going seriously in, in British North America, right? The other major focal point of the Spanish Empire is the Caribbean. It's important, Cuba's important, but not because of resources. It's important because it's the entry and exit to the empire. It's how you get that silver in and out. It's the shipping lanes. For the Portuguese, they have this commercial global empire. Brazil, they settle on the coast. They go, oh, not much here. Let's plant some sugar cane. We did this in the islands in the Atlantic. We'll see how that works. Bring a few Africans over. Hey, this works pretty well. So on the coast of Brazil, after 1570, what you get is the expansion of the first plantation <coughs> complex in the Americas, the thing we take for granted. Cash crop using African slave labor. They build these on the coast of northeastern Brazil, right? and these gradually become incredibly dynamic in the modern Atlantic slave trade really picks up after 1570 and his slaves coming from West Africa and Angola directly across to Brazil to the northeastern coast. In the 17th century, the Dutch and the French and the English will do this in the Caribbean. And then what is the US South? Right? Cash crops for export, African slave labor. So, but I want to emphasize Brazil is the great exception of Portugal's empire. But here's a map that sort of shows you both of these empires. These are the first global empires. In some ways, Portugal's the last. Portugal does not give back Macau until 1997, right? Even though the Chinese have been running it for about 100 years. <laughs> um, so Portugal really is setting up these trading outposts all along the coast of West and East Africa. The center of their Asian empires on the western coast of India at Goa. They control almost all the key nodal points for shipping, right? Entry into the Persian Gulf, the Straits of Malacca, where Singapore is now. The Portuguese don't control all this territory physically and militarily. They should try to control the access points. So you pay fees to them to ship in the empire. But where they're making their money is in the East Indies, clove, cinnamon, nutmeg. Right? And they stretch as far as Macau on the coast of China, right across from what today is Hong Kong, and on the southern coast of Japan. So they have a truly global trading empire. They're trading primarily spices. Francis I, who was king of France this time, used, he, had, he had great one-liners. He referred to the uh, Portuguese king as the grocer king. <laughs> um, but the Spanish basically, they literally, by accident, they stumble into the Americas. Columbus thinks he's going to Asia. They stumble on these two enormous empires with huge silver deposits. So Spain becomes a colonial power primarily focused in the Americas, but the Spanish will go all the way to the Philippines, right? Named after King Philip. So it's true, both of these are truly global empires. Okay. As you can see here, the most important piece of the Portuguese empire. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and the French and the English come late. Right? They gotta get their act together. They're all, you know, fighting religious wars and roses are fighting each other. <laughs> all these sort of things. The French primarily, as you'll see on the map here in a second, in the north established himself what today is Quebec. Okay. Their richest colony in the Americas is what they call Saint-Domingue, right? The island of Hispaniola, the, the first, the oldest European created city in the Americas is Santo Domingo, it's created in 1493. Right. So the area is known as Santo Domingo. So as the French gradually start to occupy the western into the island and establish a foothold, they call it Saint-Domingue, what today is Haiti. It is the richest colony on the planet in the 18th century. Incredible wealth, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, about 400,000 slaves and about 50,000 whites. 
is an incredibly rich colony. So the French are in lots of different places. The French come in late and they're not very successful. And they finally, they try and establish, they actually occupy briefly what today is Rio de Janeiro, and a couple of places on the northern coast of Brazil. All they end up with is French Guiana. Yeah, great choice. <laughs> a few tiny islands in the Caribbean, but Saint-Domingue is what matters in, in Quebec, right? And eventually they're going to sort of claim everything from Quebec to New Orleans, right? Even though, that, again, that's sort of a fiction, right? It's okay, nobody else has challenged us yet. Um, the English, right? Let's face it, the English show up in Virginia in 1607, 1609, right? Jamestown. Any of you guys ever been to Jamestown? Yeah. Like, what were they thinking? <laughs> I went to Jamestown in July and I'm going, like, <laughs> what? What, are they, what are they selling a swamp for? <laughs> And so they wander in the early 17th century, you know, they're doing this in the Caribbean. It's like, they're really late, right? So, it, you know, by 1607, the Spanish have been in the Caribbean for 100 years. Right? Sugar plantations in Brazil have already taken off. And it takes, you know, another 100 years before the English are really firmly settled in the British North American mainland, right? So the English come in late. But like the French, and the ones I'm not mentioned here, the Dutch, right? first focal point of their entry into the Americas is the Caribbean Basin. It's pirates of the Caribbean, right? right? Why do we have pirates? Because it's a Spanish lake, right? But in the 17th century, as Spain weakens, the other colonial would-be powers enter into the region. This is the shipping lanes of the empire, attack, gain control of bases. So when you look at the Caribbean today, right, all those British islands and French islands and Dutch islands, this is a legacy of the wars, the global wars fought in the 17th century. So those become staging grounds to attack the Spanish shipping lanes. Right? The Dutch are actually the most successful. So it's not to the middle of the 17th century that the English move into Barbados and Jamaica. Right? Even later into places like Trinidad. Uh, so they're late to come in, and this is why what you see is they got all these tiny little islands. It looks more impressive on a map, which <laughs> is like fill in all the space. So, the, so what you got is up in the north there, you got some, you got Quebec, they control the southern part of the Mississippi River, but they're really sandwiched in between Spain, quite literally, because Spain owns what's today Florida, right, and what is the southwest United States, and you've got sort of British colonies up and down the eastern seaboard. So the French are kind of squeezed in the middle there. But the Caribbean Basin is really what's more important for the French. Saint-Domingue is what's producing the, their wealth. This is their, their great, they don't need silver, they've got slaves and sugar in, in Haiti, in Saint-Domingue. So, what this all comes down to then is you've got this, by the time you get to about the 1770s, you have several hundred years, especially in the Spanish Empire, of colonial settlement, right? And think of this in a place like Mexico. Since the 1520s, you have had Spanish colonists continually coming over, some of them staying. So by 1750, you have over 200 years, right, of families who have established, had children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, right? They've been there a long time they increasingly see themselves not only as Spaniards, but Spaniards from this place. In a place like Virginia, by the time you get to 1750, you have 100, maybe 150 years of people settling there, identifying locally, right? seeing themselves as different from the guys back in the metropolis. Let's face it, the guys in the metropolis are making them very aware of this. <laughs> you speak funny. <laughs> you aren't aware of what goes on in London. Right? You're not one of us. This is really pronounced in the Spanish Empire. There is a term to distinguish among Spaniards, those who were born in Spain and those who were born in the Americas. Those who were born in Spain is known, are known as peninsulars. And they look down their noses when they're in the Americas at these guys who are Americans, right? So the locals become known as Creoles. The original meaning of Creole was the child of an African born in the New World. And they still use this word in Portuguese, criolo. But eventually it becomes something from outside that is part of the, that emerges in the Americas. So you get creole using all sorts of sense, types of cooking, 
people, but in the Spanish Empire, the Creoles, the Criollos, right, are Spaniards, but they're Spaniards born in the Americas. So by the 1750s and 1760s, in all of these colonies, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, you have families that have been there for a long time and increasingly identified locally. In many cases, have lived there for many generations. Um, so these Creoles, I love to say this, George Washington's a Creole. <laughs> right? I mean, think of this. These guys, they're Brits, right? But they must sound different, right? And they may have never been to England, but every time one of those British guys shows up, they go like, oh, these Americans, <laughs> right? You're not really one of us. So what would have happened is we're going to see if they had simply been nicer <laughs> to these guys. Oh, OK, you're all right. Come on over. Join in Parliament. <laughs> you can be one of us. So this well-developed colonial elites is crucial. And it's these well-developed colonial elites who are reading Voltaire and Rousseau and Thomas Paine, right? Who are going, hmm, why do we have monarchy? <laughs> you know, well, maybe a republic would be a good idea, right? And many of these people are truly transatlantic. They are going back and forth across the Atlantic. The Brazilians have no universities, right? So all the colonial children, male, who get educated, go back to Portugal and are educated in Portugal. They see what it's like, and then they come back to Brazil. Uh, I also want to emphasize, these are relatively small European populations. In most Americas, dominate an enormous non-European population. Haiti is the most dramatic example, right? Few 10,000 Europeans, over nearly half a million, People of either African descent or born in Africa to come across as slaves. Um, in Spanish America, in a place like Mexico, in 1750, the vast, vast majority of the population are people of indigenous descent, speaking Indian languages, living in traditional villages. It's, it's an island of Europeans right, in a sea of Indians. In the islands of the Caribbean, and in Brazil, it's small groups of Europeans and a vast majority of people of African descent, most of them in slavery. That's why, as we're going to see, you think twice about a war for independence in a place like Cuba when you see how many slaves there are around. Right? And you raise the possibility that if you start a war, you may not be able to control it, and it might become another Haitian revolution. By and large, almost all these places are plantation societies. Brazilian sugar, Brazilian gold, Brazilian tobacco, tobacco, cotton, rice, you name it. Most of these are plantation societies. And ironically enough, as we're going to see with the American Revolution, it's the backward places that have the best advantage, the poor colonies. So think of this. In 1760, right, the South. <laughs> The U.S. South has this rich plantation society with slave labor. They're doing fine, right? And it's going to grow in the 19th century. Who are the backward cousins? These guys in New England. They can't produce anything, <laughs> right? Think about this. What are you going to grow in Vermont? Oh, I have some more maple syrup. <laughs> you know, so up in the north, it's like, OK, you can't produce much here. So what do they got to do up there? They say, OK, we'll get involved in shipping, uh, crafts, eventually finance. Right? It turns out that was a pretty good direction. <laughs> so the northern half of the 13 colonies right, are not a plantation society and have a completely different character from those places, the Mason-Dixon line south, where you have plantation, agriculture, and large slave populations. And if you look around most of the Americas, there is a certain advantage to not having developed these large plantation societies built on forced labor. I'll pick one, Costa Rica. Costa Rica has an enormous advantage when it enters the 19th century because it was so poor. There was essentially no important agriculture. There was no enslaved population. There was no forced Indian labor. So what enters into the, the modern world as an independent nation in the early 19th century, it does not have the legacy of large landed estates, forced Indian labor, African slave labor. They don't have to deal with those issues. It gives them an advantage. All right, so what we got here then to summarize, there's this massive economic transformation taking place. 
leads to the Industrial Revolution in this period, driven by England primarily, this culture and intellectual ferment, especially radiating out of France. The emergence of classical political liberalism is this radical ideology. Individual rights, what's that? <laughs> the world would be chaos. And in particular, what is important is you reach the moment by the late 18th century where you have this consolidation of mature and increasingly self-confident colonial elites who are going, hey, maybe we can do this ourselves. Right? Why do we need these guys telling us what to do? But that alone is not enough, right? <coughs> As we'll see with the American Revolution, those things, this is counterfactual, right? What if they said, okay, we'll give you representation when we tax you, right? What if the Spanish king had said, okay, these colonies, you become part of the empire with representation of your colonial elites? It would have been a very different world, but in the end, what's gonna happen is because of the intransigence of the monarchs to not allow these colonial elites to have a greater voice in the system, but they're gonna revolt. Now, surely you guys have some questions. <laughs> Covered enough here. I read somewhere that a large uh, import of gold and silver by the Spanish devalued gold and silver. So the end effect was that sugar and uh, I guess tobacco became more valuable than uh, uh, what the Spanish were doing. And so are we going to get to the point that? Can you guys hear that? No. The question is, if the Spanish and then the Portuguese are exporting huge <coughs> amounts of silver and gold across the Atlantic, and this has a distorting effect on the European economy, what, what's clear of what it does is it causes inflation, right? Now, in our world, we think, oh, five, six percent inflation. This probably causes inflation of one percent per year. But for those days, that was like <coughs> incredible, right? So it does cause this inflation. So in the 17th century, right, this gold, the gold, it's primarily silver from the Spanish Empire, it really starts to flow about the 1570s and peaks about 1610 or so. Uh, and the argument, there's huge arguments over this in economic history, right? The argument is that what's taking place here is a sudden influx of all this stuff causing this inflation. It causes an economic crisis in the 17th century. So if you look at the Atlantic world, Europe and the Americas in the 17th century, what you enter into is a long depression from about the 1620s to about the 1710s, especially in the Spanish Empire. Spain goes broke three or four times, even though they've got all the silver. So there's huge arguments over to what extent this stimulates and to what extent it hinders European economies. And one of the standard arguments is that what happens is about 1710 or 1720, you come out of this long century of recession. You got the gold from Brazil in particular, which is primarily flowing into England, and that then fuels the next phase, which is the Industrial Revolution. So the Brazilians, the Portuguese will say to you, it's Brazilian gold that finances the economic expansion of the 18th century. 80% of the gold circulating in the Western world in the 18th century came out of Brazil. This is what banks were up to. I mean, Spain basically spends the last half of the 16th century fighting the Counter-Reformation. Right? The great Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, King of Spain, is the great warrior. Right? And they go broke multiple times fighting wars. Uh, Charles, is he's rarely at home. <laughs> right? His son, Philip II, who is equally phenomenal, or right? an incredible father, is the great religious figure, sort of ascetic, and practically never leaves home. <laughs> uh, so partly what's had, the, this is the advantage of backwardness argument too. It's the curse of having too much wealth. That Spain enjoys this century of enormous global expansion, but it pays the price for the next 300 years. That basically after 1600, it's all downhill for Spain until the 1970s. <laughs> um, Spain, Spain's empire just grows weaker. So in the 17th century, the, you have the emergence first the Dutch, then the English, then the French. By the 18th century, the Spaniards are hanging on for dear life. Right? In the 19th century, Spain's in chaos. It's lost most of its empire, internal civil wars. 
then you get, you know, it's not until post-Franco that Spain really reemerges. Right? As our old colleague Paul Friedman used to say, it's like they had the World's Fair in Spain in 92 and they joined the EU. So finally, Spain's returned. It's a part of Europe now. <laughs> but they pay a very high price for, for having, to, it's like in the 20th century, it's the curse of oil. And this time it was the curse of too much silver. Somebody over here? All right, she wants a historian to predict the future for Northern Africa. <laughs> I, my old joke is that historians are terrible at predicting the past. <laughs> I'm the guy who was six months before Samosa was overthrown. Oh, they'll never get rid of it. Uh, uh, Panama Canal, no way we'll ever get rid of it. Um, here's what, I've seen this movie before many times, and there is, it's like authoritarian regimes, repressed elites, masses yearning to breathe free, right? Suddenly something explodes and all hell breaks loose, right? This is why I say, as a historian, he uses revolution normally very precisely. Probably what we're watching is lots of upheavals. We're probably not watching very many revolutions, maybe none. Um, the question becomes, do you actually fundamentally change what's there? And for most of these places in the Middle East, that means do you become more democratic, more participatory, more pluralistic, have greater freedom of press? But as many commentators on all sides of the political spectrum have pointed out in the last couple of weeks, there are two contradictory things often going on here that always go on in US foreign policy. Our desire for other peoples to have freedom and democracy and our national interests. And those are not always the same thing. So what happens if you get a democracy in Egypt and it turns out to be anti-American? You got a democracy. Um, and this is the hard thing for Obama or anybody else. And plus, let's face it, the, that whole stretch from North Africa to the Middle East, those are, almost every one of those countries is completely different, right? So I mean, Libya is just worlds apart from a place like Yemen or Egypt, right? But I would say, this is why I always like to say, who is actually emerging with power? Do you actually, are they gonna have a, elections in Egypt and will there actually be real elections? Do you rewrite the constitution? Do new people actually have access to power? Uh, the dilemma for the United States is those are troubled moments in any regime, right? Because it allows everybody to suddenly be in and some of those people are not the ones you wanna see. So what would happen, I mean, here's the classic, in El Salvador, from my own experience, in El Salvador in the 1980s, the United States spent several billion dollars, right? Which is chump change for American foreign policy, right? Several billion dollars in the midst of a civil war to stop a guerrilla uprising, right? And to keep a government in power and to hold the first truly free elections in the history of El Salvador. And when we had those elections, the bad guys won. <laughs> the extreme right death squad guys won <laughs> in a free and fair election. <laughs> so what do you do? It's like you held your free election, right? And this is a dilemma. So if you really do believe you want to let everybody have a voice and you believe in the self-determination of people, sometimes they're going to be people who don't like you. And so this is why the people who want to be the realists in this, who want to criticize the administration, are going to say, forget all that stuff. We just need the national interest, <laughs> which usually means the status quo. So it leaves us in a dilemma. Latin America has been like this for a long time. Central, this was the story in Central America for decades, right? The famous phrase about, Take your pick, Batista, Samosa. He's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, <laughs> right? So if it's gonna stay calm, don't rock the boat, okay. Um, so when the Sandinistas and revolution takes shape in the 1970s in Nicaragua, to actually somehow say, okay, it's a good thing Samosa's out, it's a tough thing to do because in the end, the people who achieve power are ones who are anti-American. So this is why I think, you know, if you look across this, it, I'm teaching a graduate seminar on nationalism and nation building right now. If you look at this, it's sort of, you know, this is a different wave than the 18th century or even post-World War I or even post-World War II. Because all of these guys have all these people that went before. So they can say, okay, what's the nation supposed to look like? What are the tools we need, right? And how do we create this, right? And then, now what's our political context? So they have, 
the advantage of other models to look at, but they're not all the same models. So they may choose and say, well, we actually like the one that took place in, you know, India. Right. We'll choose South Africa. So they have lots of other options. That's right. What we're likely to get across the Middle East and North Africa is lots of different, in the short term, in games, right? So that Tunisia, let's say, for example, might actually, you know, have elections and something in Egypt might end up being a fairly controlled regime. In Libya, <laughs> doesn't look good. Doesn't look good for anybody at this point. How come you focus so little on the Dutch in your presentation? Because they have a very, the Dutch are really interesting. I mean, if you stop thinking about it, Portugal, a million and a quarter people when it goes out across the globe. England, tiny little island. Dutch, tiny little places. All these little bitty places that are seafaring go out. In the end, the Dutch have their moment. And their moment is roughly from about 1620 to about 1720. When the Dutch emerge in the 1620s, they become the most powerful navy on the planet. They supplant. Portuguese all over Asia. So Portuguese in Nagasaki, they negotiate with the Japanese, and they set up this place called Hiroshima. Oh, a weird historical coincidence. <laughs> they take control of Portuguese possessions in what today is Sri Lanka. They seize Malacca, what today is Indonesia. They move into the coast of Africa and for a, brief, for a few decades control the slave trading ports in what today is Ghana, Angola, Nigeria. They seize the northeastern coast of Brazil and hold it for 30 years. This is when they move into Curaçao. This is when they, sh they show up in Manhattan, right? <laughs> um, so they have this moment where they look like the Portuguese, except militarily more powerful. And then the English emerge. And by the end of the 17th century, it's pretty clear looking back now, the English established naval supremacy. And so the Dutch end up being a secondary global power with pockets all over the place. Uh, whereas this equally small place called England projects itself truly globally and with massive colonies. So you look around the world today, you can see those traces of Indonesia, right? Uh, Curaçao, uh, uh, Guyana, right? The sort of remains of these kinds of Dutch places. Uh, here's an interesting historical side note. When the Dutch come to receive it, take control of it in, in the 1620s, the Dutch Republic at that point is probably has the greatest religious freedom of anywhere in the world. The first synagogue in the Americas is in Recife in northeastern Brazil. And when the Dutch um, retreat, that's the Brazilian version, retreat from Recife in the 1650s, they put all the people on a ship and they come in. So the first synagogue in the Americas is Jews from Dutch Brazil. But I think the Dutch tend, it's like the Portuguese, they, they had this global commercial empire that didn't occupy lots of territory, and so in, when everything shakes down, nobody remembers them. They remember you know, the French and the British. When you said commercial empire, so there was a real shift between monarchy, This is where the Dutch, the Dutch are the great capitalists of the 17th century. They set up companies with shares. And so in the 1620s, the Dutch West India fleet, right, operating for the West India Company, right, captures the entire Spanish silver fleet as it leaves Havana. The and this is kind of like the company, you know, the colony takes all of its money and puts it in the Brinks truck. <laughs> and on the way to the bank, they, can't, like, they take the entire silver fleet and sail back to Amsterdam, right? I mean, think of the dividends they pay that year. <laughs> so they really do set this up. This is a business, right? And this becomes the kind of model that you set up what we would think of today as corporations with shareholders that, that limited are liability. with limited liability so that what you're doing is a commercial transaction. So in the 17th century, they're the great pioneers of what we would think of today as global finance, right? The money that's flowing in and out. I mean, part of the reason they're so successful is because they engage in what we would think today as finance, right? Uh, all those instruments of credit, right? That you have to trust <laughs> that this piece of paper is worth something, even though you don't actually have the gold, right? And tulips, right? This is why it's, it amazes me. So you look at the Dutch and the Portuguese, nobody 
well, I don't know, there's certain places on the planet, I'm sure, <laughs> the South Maluka Islands. People don't think of all oh, those bad old Dutch. You think of, you know, you know, wooden shoes and windmills. And I mean, they were colonial exploiters like everybody else. Oh yeah, I mean, this has been a controversy in universities. Brown, Yale, all those places. Many of the founders and major donors made their money in the slave trade. And you get, it's like, as a southerner, it's like, oh, okay, look, we were all complicit in this, right? It's not like you blame us because we had the slaves down here, but this is why, I mean, John Adams, all these guys, they're engaged in shipping in the West Indies. What are they shipping? Molasses, making rum, all this stuff is part of a, an economy that's built on slavery. So you may not own slaves, but your livelihood depends upon a commercial system that's built on slavery. Whether you're taking the sugar or the molasses or whether you're shipping alcohol back to the slave plantations, you're providing beef, jerk beef or foodstuffs, you're part of this slave system in the Atlantic world. So part of what New England's doing is they're financing and shipping as a part of the system which is built on plantations and slavery. All right, one more question. Uh, you mentioned the American Revolution was a revolution for one, uh, unique for one reason. George Washington refused to run a third time. He could have been reelected probably the rest of his life before he died. And he set the model. And that's an exception. And this is why we're ex extraordinarily lucky. I, there actually is another example of this in the modern period. I always say that my second favorite country, Costa Rica. Costa Rica has what you can argue is a true revolution in 1948. There's a big debate about this. But the guy who takes power, Jose Figueres, sets up a junta. He says, I'm going to be here for 18 months. We're going to rewrite the Constitution. We're going to change all these things. And after 18 months, I'm stepping down. After 18 months, he steps aside. And then he runs for president. The next election gets elected. I mean, very few, ex you're very few examples of people taking power by force right, and voluntarily relinquishing it. And this is what makes Washington pretty amazing. He could have been king, <laughs> right? But he knew he was going to step aside. And this, this is an enormous difference with some of the places in Latin America where the initial leaders, are, they get in, and they're not going to go out unless you forcibly push them out. All right, so next time, the American Revolution. Thanks.